Good morning. Good morning. Let us stand and turn to number 881, the Apostles' Creed. Let's read together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sing number 419, I am thine, O Lord. Number 419.
morning. Good morning. Our first lectionary reading comes from John chapter 6, turn my brightness, verses 24 through 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went into Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God is good. All the time. And all the time. This morning for announcements, we have Sunday school at 10 a.m. Our worship service is at 11. Today is Communion Sunday. If you will uh, dispose of your cups as you leave, uh, there's a trash can out by the front door. Today also after church, we'll have a meeting of the nominating committee. And that consists of Beth Burchett, Leslie Anderson, Sandy Walters, Johnny Ford, and Sandy Penix. Be real brief. And the pastor. <laughs> Uh, son, the fourth Sunday's offering was for the Salem's Maintenance Fund. Last Sunday we collected $251. We have collected $946. The cost of the needed projector is $3,000. The altar flowers this Sunday are given in love by Hazel to honor the memory of her mother, Ollie Marie Cook. We have other Sundays open for this month, so if you want to surprise someone, uh, put their name on the list. Our Wednesday night Bible study is Elijah living outside the comfort zone. Our question for this week is who would you trust to lead you through difficulty or danger? Fellowship and Pizza is at 530. The Bible study is at 6. And there are some August activities listed in your bulletin. We have upcoming school beginning this year, so we need to be working on the backpack ministry. If you want to offer some funds for that, please do so in the offering plate. Any other announcements? Uh, I have a real quick one. In, in, in response to the maintenance fund for the projector, uh, Larry and I found out Friday, is that right, or yesterday? We got the, the email from it. Yeah, that the United Methodist Church has a grant available to churches, and it's around $1,500 for technical uh, and some other things, and uh, it's just a real short grant. You know, normally they're 20 pages long. This one is two pages. So, um, so I'll be getting that filled out Monday. So pray for that, and we hope that maybe they will, you know, help us uh, get towards that goal of our projector. So just wanted to share that. Good deal. In our prayer list this morning, we want to continue to remember Jeff and Christine McKinney, David Chafin, Sarah, Chafin's getting, Ch Sarah Chafin is getting ready for surgery. Remember Brandon Robinson, Bobby Hamilton, Doris Taylor's mother, Dan Paternio, Hazel's granddaughter Avery, Bill Murphy, Nan Nanette Schmidt, and Lindsay Emma, and all the COVID cases we have around. Any spoken prayer requests? Carla? That's a request for Jimbo Turner. Anyone else have any prayer requests? If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. All right. As we get ready to go to the Lord prayer, are there any unspoken prayer requests this morning by lifting your hands? God sees your hand and knows the need that it represents. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, today we just want to thank you, God, for your blessings that you give us each and every day. 
we just want to take a moment to give you praise. to you and ask, Lord, for forgiveness of sins. And we bring those prayer requests to you, Lord, that were lifted today and those on our hearts. taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, um, we're going to uh, mention our offering. We don't have any special singing today for Communion Sunday, uh, but we want to thank you. Uh, our offering plate is located in the back of the church, and uh, you can feel free to, if you have it, to, to give, and we thank you for the blessings. Is there anything, finance, uh, we got, a, I guess, just a thing from... The apportionment, so I think it's the latest email that we're all up to date. We're up to date on apportionment and uh, our, our giving, so thank you for that. Um, all right, if nothing else, uh, let's do our doxology and then we'll ask Richie to pray. Today, I'm glad to have our visitors with us, Chris and Ron. If you want to say more about that and introduce uh, your family, that'd be great. One of my sons, uh, Chris, my oldest son, Chris, is here with his daughter, Miss Scarlett. We're very proud to have them. Amen. The scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. Therefore, the prisoner in the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit to the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, 
just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us <coughs> come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, <coughs> from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Let's pray. Father, we pray for a uniting body of, of Christ, that we might know that each member has worth, that we might recognize our gifts, Father, and work for the fulfillment. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we've been doing this uh, series on uh, in the book of Ephesians, a worship series geared up for life, and we are today talking about a life worthy. And I, before I forget it, I want to mention that what we don't want to think this is talking about is that uh, we're not worthy and, and that we, we have to get worthy in order for God to love us. That's a misconception. What it's talking about, God already loves you, just as you are, but we want to live up to our potential, to our calling, just like we would want from any of our children. I, I can't imagine saying to my child, if you don't do this and this and this, I won't love you. But I might say, I already love you, just the way you are, but I have expectations of you, or uh, you know, I can be disappointed or whatever, but it doesn't change our love. And so when we're talking about living a worthy life, he's not talking about getting worthy. Like, for example, this morning when we do communion. If it's only for those of us who are perfect and worthy, I don't think any of us would be taking communion this morning. Right? I mean, we'd all have to just throw it in a can because we can't. All, it, none of us are really worthy in and of ourselves, but yet we're loved by God, so that makes us worthy. We want to live up to the potential to where God has for us, just like we want for our family. And so this, <clears throat> this section, kind of a new section that we're starting on, uh, kind of reads like poetry in a way, but it also reads like a father who's talking to a wayward child almost. Uh, and it begins with this section here, uh, with this verse. I therefore the prisoner in the Lord lead you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Interesting way to start a letter. I'm a prisoner. He doesn't mean that symbolically. He literally is a prisoner when he's writing this epistle. He is in jail, and he's in jail simply for refusing not to talk about Jesus and his faith. And as he's in jail, we're reminded that he has basically given up his rights. He has become a prisoner of God that he might be free and teach others how to be free. Some people are prisoners in their own mind and hearts. And some of the people that I've met in jail are more free, are more free than some of the people out on the streets because they have liberty uh, that God has set them free. 
The Bible says, if you've been set free, you're free indeed. So he says, I'm the prisoner in the Lord. And then he says, I beg you. Very, very, very stressful word here. I beg you not. I want to ask you something. Would you mind doing this? No, I beg you. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling which you have been called. Notice already you've been called. And he's simply saying, I want you to live this life that you already blessed with. It's not that you're trying to win God's love. You already have that. There's nothing you could do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. God loves you just the way you are. But I've said it before. God loves you the way you are, but He loves us too much to leave us that way. We're all in, uh, capable of growth. And if we're not growing, we're dying. So we need to be growing. So we begin by, uh, he says in Ephesians 4.15, we are to grow up in every way unto Him who is the head into Christ. And so the one word that would really capture everything here this morning is the word maturity. And it, it's mentioned here in the passage. But we're growing up to uh, Christ and to maturity. He says in Hebrews, so let us stop going over the basics of Christianity again and again and again. And let us go on instead. The King James says perfection. I like this better. It says, let us become mature. That's really what he's talking about. That word perfection is a little disconcerting these days. And there are some people who think they're perfect. I don't happen to think so. But anyway, I believe mature is a much better word. Because the idea there is really, uh, in, in sanctification, it's a process. It's not something that happens all at once. Where you're walking around one day and zap, you are perfect. I wish it were that way. I wish it were, but it's not. It's a process. It's a lifelong process of growth that culminates in heaven and glory. That we will never truly be perfect, perfect, until we're, we have a perfect body. It's, you can't be perfect in an imperfect body. It's an impossible thing. The God part of you may be perfect, but we are all imperfect. And so, uh, those people that say, well, you know, I don't want to go to church because they're, they're just as bad as I am. You're right. They are just as bad as you are. The only difference, you know, is, is we, we have asked for forgiveness and we're trying to live the best we can. But we're all imperfect. We want to be mature. And then he says in 1 Peter, like newborn infants, like babies who are just born, long for the pure spiritual milk of the Word of God, that by it you may grow up in salvation. And so it is that when a child is born into the world, we have to start them off on things that babies eat, baby formulas and milk. They're not ready for T-bone steak quite yet, but they have to grow into that. And I don't know if you ever noticed, but a child who's hungry, uh, how, how much they long for that, that milk, that nourishment. And they'll cry for it or whatever. And when they get it, you, can just t you see that they, they just love it so much. And that's what he's saying, that you and I ought to desire God and spiritual things like a baby craves milk. We ought to want it that much. And you know... The other thing is that we don't stay there. We don't stay in the milk stage. He says we move on to the meat stage. But that is, the truth is, there's a lot of people today who are still infants when it comes to spiritual maturity. They've never grown. They've never processed. And, and Hebrews said, let us go on and let's not keep going to the same thing and over and over. And I've told you before, I remember growing up in church and some of the Baptist churches I grew up in, uh, the same message basically every week. You're going to hell and you need to get saved. You're going to hell and you need to get saved. Every week. There was never any growth in that kind of message. I mean, there's so much more to talk about today. First of all, it makes God look like a tyrant who's out to just get us. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think God is a loving parent who wants everything in His power to draw us to Him, not to send us away. So the problem is that there's a lot of people today who do not mature in Christ. 
They don't grow. They're still like uh, spiritual infants in the nursery. They don't grow beyond whatever, you know, they may have been in the church for 20 years and have never advanced. And Paul says that's, that's a problem. So here's the thing I want to say first of all. If you want to grow in your spiritual life, here's some things we need to realize. First of all, I must desire my spiritual maturity. You have to desire it on your own. I believe that we can grow, and I believe God wants us to grow, and I believe the church can provide ways for you to grow, but you have to be the one to want to grow. It's not going to happen automatically. It's got to come for yourself. Look what he says there. Take time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. You see, it's the same thing with physical exercise. You know, a lot of us would say, boy, uh, I, I sure, I'd sure like to lose weight, or I'd sure like to be healthy, or I'd sure, I'd sure like to have more muscles. Well, just wishing it is not going to make it happen. We have to do something to make it happen. And it's hard work, folks. It's not easy. The same thing is true in the Christian life. To become more mature, spiritually speaking, it takes some discipline. It takes some discipline that many people do not have. And we have to develop those disciplines. So you have to take the time and the trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. So you have to desire spiritual maturity. You have to want it. And the truth is, some people just don't want it. They want other things instead. And so, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. The old saying says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can bring a Christian to church, but you can't make them grow. You know, that comes through desire, first of all. Secondly, I must develop my spiritual maturity. So, wanting it is the first thing. And secondly, developing. It says in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, first of all, we've been given inspiration of God, the, the Scriptures to help us in growth. And there's doctrine to tell us, you know, what is right and what is wrong. There's reproof when we need to know that how to get right, and correction and instruction in righteousness and how to stay right. And so there is growth just like a baby in the milk. There's growth that comes when we are digesting spiritual truth, scriptural truth. And uh, so we have to develop spiritual maturity. It takes time to do that. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. But we have to develop it. And we talked about, you know, babies. Uh, I mean, how many of us expect a baby to act like an adult? Sometimes we may do that. But the truth is, a baby is a baby. And adults should act like an adult, not babies. And, and the thing is, we have a lot of spiritual babies in the world. And that's because we haven't matured and we haven't grown. Um, think about it. What, a baby is the most selfish person in the world, right? I mean, if a baby doesn't get what they want, what do they do? They cry. They whine, right? That's all they do. And if you give a baby something, do they ever thank you? They ever say, thanks, Mom, for that bottle of milk? No, they don't thank you. They don't have no reason to thank you. And then, you know, uh, if they don't get what they want, they get mad. Everything is about them. Everything centers around them. They don't care about anybody else. They don't give anybody else anything. They may deposit something in their diapers. That's about it. But they don't give you much of anything. What you get is your own love for them. But they never really give you thanks for it. That's because they're, they haven't learned yet how to be unselfish. They have to be taught those things. And there's a lot of selfish people in the church today, by the way, who haven't learned how to grow. And I think one of the uh, steps of maturity is learning how to grow in the Christian life. And so that's number three. I must demonstrate my spiritual maturity. Look what he says. Who is among you as wise and understanding? Let him show it by his good behavior. You see, we have the 
we have mistaken sometimes the thing that Bible knowledge for maturity. We think if someone knows the Bible and they, they go to Bible study and they do all these things that they're spiritually mature. And the truth is that may not be the case. The Bible says that we show our spiritual maturity in our Christianity by how we live our lives and how we treat other people. And one of the ways that we know that someone is spiritually immature is the way they treat other people. We have to understand that uh, love is shown and maturity is shown by good behavior. And if you are a person who feels like you have to have your way or nobody, or it's my way or the highway, that's not a spiritually mature person. That's a sign of a spiritually immature person. Well, if you don't do it my way, I'm going to take my offering and I'm going to go home. No, that, that's not very mature. But we let spiritually immature people run the church sometimes. I've been in a lot of churches where I've seen that happen, where the immature are the people who run the church because one, one thing, they got the biggest mouth, and two, they got the biggest pocketbook. So they get to run things, and they are the most selfish, secular people in the world. Now, I know that sounds harsh, but it's a reality. And the fact of the matter is that just because someone has knowledge and has money or has status or whatever doesn't necessarily mean that they're qualified to run things. Same thing as pastors. Some, some of the pastors uh, are, are selfish and prideful and all that. And, and that's why they want to be pastors maybe. And, and, and hopefully, you know, God's been working on me a long time to rid some of that stuff. But I still find myself sometimes being selfish and prideful and hateful and all these things. These are things that do not come from a heart of maturity. Let me give you an example. I've seen a lot of people come and go, even in this church. People who get mad over one thing or another and in other churches. But I've yet to see somebody come back through that door and say, Pastor... You know, I got mad because you said what you said, or you preach what you preach, or whatever. And I was really upset. But after reflecting on it, I realized that what you were saying was true. And I'm sorry. And I want to come back. Nobody does that. Now, either everybody's right and I'm wrong, or maybe pride gets in the way. Maybe there's too much pride for us to say, I was wrong. That's a sign of spiritual immaturity, by the way. So what happens is, you got these babies that are running around in different churches, and everywhere they go, there ends up being a split. There ends up being problems because they've not matured themselves. All I'm saying is, growth takes reflection upon ourselves. It takes us to be able to say, for example, in a marriage, in a relationship, in a church, to be able to go up and say, you know what? You know what, honey? Uh, I've thought about what you said. And after thinking about it, I, I know I, I was upset. But I think you're right. I think you're right. If we're not able to do that, then I seriously doubt how our maturity Really today. I'm not just talking about in Christ, but maturity in emotionally and all of that. Who among you is wise and understanding? And understanding, let him show it by his good behavior. You know, the truth is, the church has been guilty of a long time of bad behavior toward good people. And what I'm saying is, there's a lot of people that we've condemned. We put out of the church, or we've not really accepted them into the church, just because they don't follow our standard of what we think they should be. And our behavior has turned a lot of people away, rather than brought a lot of people in. And I see Christ completely different. I see Christ just accepting everyone, regardless of their backgrounds, and not condemning them just because they didn't measure up. He loved everyone. He loved everyone he met. And, you know, look back in church history, and you'll see that a lot of, you know, we, we blame the Muslims a lot of times for the things that they've done. But, listen, Christians haven't had that much better a reputation. If you look back through church history, some of the people that were killed and burned, it was by Christians. Simply because they didn't, you know, agree with their doctrine at the time. 
We must show our love and our maturity by our behavior. Does that mean we always agree with each other and, and everything you say, I say, yeah, you're right? No. But what it means is that we're willing to say, you know what? I want to hear what you're saying because I, I want to reflect on it a minute. And we may come back later, for example, in a marriage, let's go back to that. We may come back later and say, you know what? I've thought about what you said and I've really reflected on it. And I appreciate you giving me feedback, but in this particular situation, I just don't agree. And here's why. Or we may come back more often than not and say, after reflecting on it, you're, you're right. Or you may say, even though I don't agree with you, the way I reacted was, was wrong. You see what I'm saying? Self-reflection, folks. Self-reflection. This is something that... that that I've been learning to do for a long time, and, and it, it, it began years ago, but I think it's, it will change your life if you let it. Demonstrating spiritual maturity is so important today. James says, do not deceive yourselves by just listening to His Word. Instead, put it into practice. You see, you can come to church, Bible study, Sunday school, all those things, and that's great. We should. But that doesn't necessarily make you a spiritual mature person. It's when we show love, when we put into practice ministry, uh, these things. Rick Warren said something like this. He said, "What the last thing a lot of people need is another Bible study. Well, one of the things we want to do is just say, well, we just need, a, we need to teach them more. We need another Bible study. He said, the last thing a lot of Christians need is another Bible study. They already know far too much. What they need to do is put into practice what they already know. Maybe he's on to something there. I think it's very true. James says, well, who, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested... Your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. Whatever's happened to you in life's past can be an opportunity for growth or bitterness. The choice is you. It's what you make of it and what you do with it. And the things that's happened to me in my past, whether it was my fault or someone else's, I've tried to learn from those things to be stronger instead of bitter. It's easy to get better at people. But what we can do is reflect on those things and say, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? Or what can you teach me in this? Not that God is doing those things, but that we can learn from those mistakes. And so today, it's really about just giving it to God and say, Lord, I want to grow. I want to be a Christian in my heart. As the musicians come this morning, I want to remind you today that we can make opportunities for you to grow, but we can't make you grow. You know, this little church, we're not open seven days a week. There's not enough things for you to do here to keep you occupied and growing in the Christian life. Let's just be honest. I can give you some things and committees, but that's not enough. You've got to find things, and it's more than just another Bible study. It's about finding ways in your community to connect. Things where there's a, a vacancy, where you can fit in, where you can help. And by the way, if you are connected and helping other people, you'll have a lot less time to worry about what other people are doing to you. And being self-pity and all those things. Because you're looking out for others. And I want you to think about that today. What can I do to help myself grow in the area of spiritual maturity. Let's pray. Father, today I just want to ask you to help us, Lord, today to take this in and realize God, that we aren't there yet. That we're in a process. We're in a journey. And all of these things in life can be lessons and stepping stones to make us better and not bitter. We pray you'd help us in that end. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the invitation is open if anyone wants to come and pray today. And this is for the Christian. We're all, we're all sinners, so this is for everybody. Let's stand and uh, sing number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
If you don't have a communion cup, uh, they're on the back table, and we'd be happy to get you one, but uh, just a little cups uh, for communion, you can get ready for that. Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have not broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Next slide, please. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us offer one another signs of re reconciliation and love. And so this morning, uh, we're not going to shake hands, but be sure on the way out uh, to just speak to your neighbor as you're able to do that. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn holy 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 lord god of power and might heaven and earth are full of your glory hosanna in the highest blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest holy are you lord and blessed is your son jesus christ your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time has come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us new, uh, made us with a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your Holy Word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself far for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you. And he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Jesus took the loaf of bread and he broke it. And because there was one loaf and there were many of them, we are one body today. For we all partake of that one. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. 
the cup over which we give thanks is the sharing in the blood of Christ. And so this morning, we invite you, the body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. There's two layers for this. Next slide, please. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Next slide. All right. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As the acolytes come and we sing today. Please stand as we turn to number 557. Blessed be the tie that binds. Let's sing verses 1 and 4. Mm -hmm. 